Dr. Tiberius Ratza was one of my Old Testament professors in seminary. He was from Romania, and, but he spoke English with great precision because uh, it was his second language, and so he learned it properly, not like we learn it here, because uh, we don't speak with precision around here. Uh, but Tibbs spoke English like a scholar. Uh, and, and he spoke through a thick Eastern European accent. So if you can just imagine hearing somebody with perfect English, but through that thick Eastern European accent, whenever he would pronounce the Hebrew words in our classes, between his accent and his level of understanding, uh, it, he sounded like a native speaker. I mean, he sounded like he came straight out of, of the Old Testament. One semester, I took a class from Tibbs on the Minor Prophets, and as if you don't know what that is, that's the shorter books at the end of the Old Testament. And during one of the classes, he was introducing the book of Habakkuk. And if you don't know much about Habakkuk, I don't imagine many sermons get preached about Habakkuk, but uh, the book of Habakkuk is a complaint. Uh, the prophet is complaining to God about the perceived injustice for when the wicked flourish and the righteous suffer. Habakkuk struggles to understand how God could use a wicked nation like Babylon for his divine purposes. Now, we're going to get into this some as we work through Jeremiah, but the conclusion that Habakkuk comes away with, it's often quoted in the New Testament. It's Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4. It says, Behold, his soul is puffed up. It is not upright within him, but the righteous shall live by faith. We may not always understand God's ways and how God is working, but we also need to understand that it's not always our place to understand God's ways and the way that he is working. But I want you to listen to the opening plea of the prophet in Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 2. He says, O Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you will not hear or cry to you violence and you will not save. I'll never forget the Hebrew lesson that our professor taught from that verse. Now I'll say this, I don't remember a lot of Hebrew vocabulary. I'm very thankful for some very smart Bible software that helps me work through some of the Hebrew language. But there's one word that is well implanted in my brain. Listen to that verse again. O oh Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you will not hear or cry to you Hamas? and you will not save. I don't know if you realize this or not, but the Hebrew word for violence is in the news quite frequently. And it's been in the news even more this week. So every time you see the group known as Hamas, just know that their identity is baked into their very name, violence. You would think that people wouldn't follow a group whose name is violence. I mean, we wouldn't necessarily follow somebody whose name was murder. Uh, so why would you follow a group whose name is violence? But as we saw this week, that is something that Hamas is very skilled with, violence. As Christians, we watch the news unfold in the Middle East and unfortunately politics come into play immediately. And I'm just gonna say this. I am not an expert on foreign policy. Uh, I did not go to school to study foreign policy, and so I am in no position to provide any advice or counsel to anybody in any position about how our secular nation should relate to the modern state of Israel. If the president called me and said, Brian, I really want you to help me understand how we should deal with Israel, I I'm gonna have to refer that to somebody who knows more. We'll let Overseer Jacob uh, take that call perhaps because uh, I don't know the answer. I don't know what should be done. But what I can do, pass that off, okay. What I can do is simply say what God says. And in Psalm 122, verse six, we have some really clear instructions. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they be secure who love you. And what I can say with a high degree of certainty is that God hasn't abandoned his covenant with the Jewish people. In fact, in Romans chapter 11, the apostle Paul spends a great deal of time discussing how God preserves a remnant of faithful Jews. How, how he does that, I don't know, and even Paul is uncertain. He concludes in Romans chapter 11, verse 33, about this very issue. He says, oh, the depths and the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and inscrutable his ways. 
for who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid for from him and through him and to him are all things to him be glory forever. Amen. I don't pretend to understand how God is working out the events in uh, the modern Middle East. I don't pretend to understand the role that the modern political state of Israel will have in God's ultimate plan. But I can tell you as Christians, it is good and it is appropriate, indeed is even commanded for us to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Likewise, I can tell you this. As we see wars erupt in our day and we hear of rumors of wars, We hear of earthquakes. Did you know this week it got covered in the news? There was an earthquake in Afghanistan, a 6.2 magnitude earthquake in Afghanistan just this week as Hamas was invading Israel and committing the brutal terrorist attack that took place this week. We know these things happen. The list goes on and on. And I can tell you today, I can point this out with great confidence that these are signs. Jesus even pointed them out in Matthew chapter 24, verse 6. He says, you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed, for this must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. And these are but the beginning of the birth pains. The birth pains that we are experiencing in our world today will result in untold human suffering. The cost of Israel invading Gaza is going to be immense. The pain and suffering that has been unfolding in Ukraine over the last year has been terrible and intense. The human suffering that unfolds as earthquakes erupt in various places has been intense. But God has told us that these things must take place, but the end is not yet. And Jesus looks at his church and he says it very clearly in Matthew 24, 14. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. Church, we mustn't fret the state of this world. But as we look around and we see signs taking place, These things ought to motivate us to consider just how consequential our generation is in God's ultimate plan of redemption. God is indeed drawing these things to a close, and we as God's people have a critical role to play in God's ultimate plan of redemption. And while none of us personally can have anything to do with what's taking place in Israel today, we can do what God says to do and pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And I would invite you to join with me as we pray for the peace of Jerusalem today. Let's go to the Lord together. Father, we come before you today as men and women who hear the news. We see news reports and we see images and videos and things that are disturbing. We see death and dismemberment. We see terrorists and hostages. We see hatred boiling over And we see the land where your people once dwelled as a nation and today as a political state that will one day again play a monumental, pivotal role in your plan of redemption. And God, as we await those things today, we still pray for peace in that land. We still pray for the suffering of the people in that land. Lord, we still pray for those who are lost in that land as there are many secular Jews and and many Muslims and, and many secular people who live there who are not followers of Jesus. And warfare means death. And unfortunately, with death, apart from Christ, there is no hope. So, Father, we pray for peace, understanding that the only way peace will actually come to that area is through the reign of the prince of peace. And so we join with the scriptures asking for your will to be done on earth as it is in heaven and in Israel and Gaza and the West Bank and all of these places that are boiling over with conflict and hatred. We ask your reign to be evident today as we work towards the gospel reaching the ends of the earth. Father, save your people. Let Jesus be made known and be made clear. Hear our prayers today, for it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.
This morning, we want to continue this journey into Jeremiah. We haven't got very far, but the last time we met, we talked about Jeremiah's calling. And I want to dig a little bit deeper into chapter one, and I, don't worry, I'm not preaching three or four sermons out of every chapter, because I know that that could take a long time. I'm not doing that, but I want us to get a good foundation under our feet as we approach the rest of the book. And I must say that as we see modern Israel involved in military conflict while working through the book of Jeremiah, it is sobering because the book of Jeremiah is going to lead us to deal with military conflict in the nation of Israel in Jeremiah's day. Jeremiah is a book that focuses on God's judgment against sin while holding out hope for future fulfillment of God's promises and his covenant. It was written to a specific generation in a specific location, but it continues to have relevance for us even to this day. You know, when you visit a different country or a different place, one of the challenges in visiting different places is learning some of the kind of the cultural colloquialisms or idiosyncrasies that, that are in those places. I was looking at this, for example, the, the OK symbol. If somebody says, you're doing OK, you throw up the OK symbol, that's OK here. But there are certain parts of the world where if you throw up the OK symbol, you're not going to be, uh, you're not going to be well received. I'll just say that. It's offensive in various parts of the world. If you're a Texas Longhorn fan, uh, you got your hook'em horns, right? Can you show that? Show us what the hook'em horn. I mean, hook'em horns. And so, I mean, that, uh, you got to be careful because I think one is Satan worshipers or something like that, or isn't that, I don't know. Um, but if you are, if you're a Texas Longhorn fan and you're in various parts of Europe or South America and the Longhorns just scored a touchdown and you want to celebrate by showing hook em horns, you better be careful because if there's some ladies around you, you have just said something inappropriate about them. So just be mindful of that if you ever go on a mission trip to South America. And if you send your Russian girlfriend, if you have a Russian girlfriend, if you send her a dozen roses, I have good news for you, you will no longer have a Russian girlfriend because you are only supposed to give flowers in Russia in, uh, in odd numbers. And so you've got to send her 11 or 13, you can't send her a dozen because you only send flowers in even numbers to funerals. So don't send your Russian girlfriend a dozen roses, send her a, bake, a baker's dozen. Anyway, it's always good to do a little research before you travel anywhere to make sure you don't inadvertently offend. When we read our Bibles, we understand that those things are exist, they're in the Bible as well. There's quirks and there's those things that are there that we don't often catch, that we don't often understand. Sometimes we just read it and think, man, that just doesn't make sense. Well, it's, there are things in the Bible that don't make sense because it was written a long, long time ago to a people who aren't like us. And so we sometimes bring our things to the Bible and it doesn't work. And the Bible has things that, that don't make sense to us. But they're there, and, and it's important that we understand them. And just because we don't always catch them, we need to remember that the original readers, the original people who heard these words, they would have caught them. Jeremiah's audience understood exactly what Jeremiah was talking about, even if we read it and we think, what is this about? Because Jeremiah's audience is who the original recipients were, not us. And so they would have caught these things. That's why it's important, I can't stress this enough, have yourself a good study Bible in your library so that you can learn about these things and not just, man, that's hard to understand. I guess I'll skip that. Get yourself a good study Bible so you can understand some of those things. In Jeremiah 1, we run across one of these little quirks. And if you miss it, you've got a much more difficult time understanding what the passage is saying. We started walking through the book of Jeremiah a couple of weeks ago by looking at how Jeremiah was called. We considered the fact that Jeremiah was, was called before God, before he was even put together in his mother's womb. God had a plan for him. God, God called him even before then. He was called and consecrated before he was ever even knit together in his mother's womb. We looked at how Jeremiah had some obstacles, and one of those was his youth and inexperience. And God promised Jeremiah, he said, he said I'm going to inspire you. I'm going to give you the words that you need. You're never going to lack for words because I'm going to make sure that you have all the words that you need. And then he even promised that he was going to be with him, he was going to deliver him, that God's presence was going to be real with the prophet Jeremiah. And as we know, his ministry didn't yield a lot of results, a lot of positive results, no real converts. We don't see sackcloth and ashes like we got from Jonah. We don't see that. Instead, in Jeremiah's call, we got the sense that his ministry would have a doom and gloom dynamic to it. 
He said that I've set you this day over nations and kingdoms to pluck up and to break down, to destroy and overthrow. Yet even in the doom and gloom, he said to build up and to plant. But in spite of the prophet's ministry and the misery of his ministry, God's presence and guidance was very real to him. Frequently, the prophets of the Old Testament would be given visions that God would have to share with the people to use those visions as sort of Old Testament object lessons, things to help the people understand what God's message was. And Jeremiah gets his first visions very early on in his call. In fact, in Jeremiah chapter 1, beginning in verse 11, we encounter the first of these visions. We're going to read that today in Jeremiah chapter 1, beginning in verse 11. I would invite you to stand as I read this from Jeremiah chapter 1, beginning in verse 11. And the word of the Lord came to me saying, Jeremiah, what do you see? And I said, I see an almond branch. And the Lord said to me, you have seen well, for I am watching over my word to perform it. Word of the Lord came to me a second time saying, what do you see? And I said, I see a boiling pot facing away from the north. Then the Lord said to me, out of the north, disaster shall be let loose upon the inhabitants of the land. For behold, I am calling all the tribes of the kingdoms of the north, declares the Lord, and they shall come and every one shall set his throne at the entrance of the gates of Jerusalem against all its walls and all around and against all the cities of Judah. For I will declare my judgments against them for all their evil in forsaking me. They have made offerings to other gods and they have worshiped the works of their own hands. Father, thank you for the call of Jeremiah, for the the difficult words with which he had to speak. I pray you would help us to embrace his words, even in our own generation and time. Guard our hearts as we seek to be obedient to you and follow your word. It's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you, be seated. The first vision that Jeremiah receives is a vision of an almond branch. We don't grow a lot of almonds in North Georgia. Uh, you know, apples and peaches are more our, our type of thing here. But almond branches were very much a part of the agricultural world of Jeremiah's day. And as a result, there's very little explanation about the significance of this vision. If this were written to us, then Jeremiah might have needed to give us an explanation of what an almond branch is actually like. He would tell us that it's one of the earliest bloomers, that, that when you see the almond branch bloom, it's a, it's a reminder, it's a guarantee of the coming change of seasons, that spring and summer are coming. Here the Lord might say, behold, I see a Bradford pear branch. Because we know what the Bradford pear means. It means the world's about to get stinky and spring is coming. That's what the Bradford pear reminds us of. And so that's what this means. The almond branch was important. They, they knew what an almond branch was. Jeremiah said, oh, that's an almond branch. Just like if you lived in South Georgia, you say, oh, that's a pecan tree. I know exactly what that is. Or a pecan tree, depending on uh, how civilized you are. You know exactly what that is. Jeremiah saw an almond branch, and then he doesn't need to explain it. Instead, he follows up with a vision related with a promise. He says that God promises to watch over his word. And what does this have to do with an almond branch? Why does, what does an almond branch have to do with this promise? Well, this is a little quirk that I was talking about. Sometimes there's quirks. This is one of them. Because the Hebrew word for almond and the Hebrew word for watch have the same three letters, the exact same three consonants. Now, if you don't know this, Hebrew is a notoriously difficult language because in its earliest forms, it didn't have vowels. And so imagine trying to speak English with no vowels. It would be very difficult to to read or to, to follow along. And so if you were going to read English with no vowels, the only way it would make sense, you, you could possibly read a page, but there are certain words that you would need some help with and you would need context and you would need pronunciation to help you understand what it was that you were reading. So if you were looking at this on paper, the word almond and the word for watch are identical because it's the same three consonants. The speaker and the hearer would only know what each other were talking about based on what was around it and how they pronounced it. Now, eventually the rabbis gave us vowel points so we can read these texts and study these texts better, but it wasn't always like that. Matter of fact, when you see them and you pronounce them, they sound almost similar. Almond is pronounced shaked and watch is pronounced shakad. The only difference between the words, you probably, you may be able to see it on the screen. The only difference between the words are those little lines under that center letter. 
That's the only difference between the words. Other than that, they're identical. And so Jeremiah's first vision is really just a play on words that God is giving us. It's just a, it's just a, a play on, on the vocabulary there. But it's a very important play. It's a very important set of words because the vision reminds us of just how careful God is with his words. He is watching over it to ensure that it does exactly what his word is intended to do. And the prophets speak of this. I love Isaiah's words about this in Isaiah 55. He said, For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so my word that goes from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose. It shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. In these Old Testament prophets like Jeremiah and Isaiah, we clearly see that God is careful with his words. Sometimes these are words of warning intended to bring about repentance before it's too late. Sometimes these are words given, um, given once it's too late and once judgment is at the door. Sometimes these words are given to restore hope and encourage a remnant of the faithful. But whatever word is given by these prophets, these are the words of God. And whether these prophecies point to pending judgment or the promise of redemption through a future Messiah, these words are true words because God watches over his words. At the same time, God's words contain such a tremendous amount of specificity. They're not the generalities of a fortune teller at the fair. These words go so far as to, as to name future persons, the significance of future places. Even Jeremiah gets in on the messianic prophecies pointing to a day when a new covenant would be inaugurated by our Lord Jesus Christ. In Jeremiah 31, he talks about the new covenant when Jesus shares the Lord's Supper with his disciples. He is doing so, and he says he is inaugurating the new covenant. There's a direct correlation between the new covenant and Jeremiah and Jesus' sharing of the Lord's Supper with his disciples. It's amazing to consider the precision with which the Lord brings about the fulfillment of his words. And all that for me reinforces my faith that those things that have yet to come to fruition are not forgotten by the Lord. They're not things that he's overlooked. They're things that haven't happened yet and there's a rock solid guarantee attached to them. As we watch the world around us, how can you not find your faith affirmed about the certainty of Jesus' visible return? The world frets when it sees these events unfold, but as Christians, as the church, we look on and say, this is exactly what he said would happen. These things were supposed to happen. These are the beginning of the birth pains. We know exactly what this means. We understand this is a call to action. This is a call to work. There are lost people who are dying and going to hell who need Jesus, and there's coming a day that it's too late. We see all of this unfolding around us today. The testimony of the Almond Branch declares it. God is watching over his word to perform it, which means his word is faithful and true. How many of us living our lives today live like we believe that, though? Like we really do believe what God says. Like we know and understand that God is keeping his word. Like we know and recognize that his commands and his precepts are right. Because after all, what you believe about something will always impact how you behave related to that thing. If you believe the scriptures, your life is going to reflect the fact that you believe the scriptures. If you doubt them, don't be surprised that your life reflects that as well. But then I think about how God watches over his word and how careful and meticulous he is with his word. And then I just can't help but think about how unlike him we are when it comes to that characteristic. Because God is so careful with his word and my goodness, I am so careless with mine. I have a hunch. I'm probably not the only person in the room today who has a problem with words being treated with the significance that they deserve. Children on the playground are taught the chant, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never harm me. You know, that's a lie straight from the devil's tongue because we know how painful words can be. James, the apostle, said the tongue is a restless evil full of deadly poison. Our words can be used to encourage, build people up, even bring about peace in the midst of conflicts. 
Our words can be used to express regret or extend forgiveness. Our words can be used to bring hope to hopelessness. Or our words can be used to tear every bit of that apart. Our words can be used to discourage. Our words can be used to tear down. Our words can be used for prideful utterances. Our words can be used to tear down hope. Our words can be used to tear down people. Our words can be used in so many different ways. What if we were to watch over our words wherever they manifest themselves? What if we were to watch over our words when they are typed into the comment boxes on the internet? I find myself expressing more and more gratitude to God for the backspace button. Because there's things that I want to say, and there's things that I can say, and then I realize that there's probably things that I shouldn't say. Backspace, 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 unless it's a really long comment, and then it's control A, delete. What if we were to watch over our words when we were in the heat of an argument with our loved ones? What if we were to watch over our words in the church and how we deal with one another both in person and behind the backs of others? That's not to say there's never a place for hard words. The Bible is full of words from God that might even be considered hard words. In fact, the next vision that Jeremiah sees is a very hard word. But even when forced into using difficult words, We ought to use those words with a great degree of caution and care. The second vision the prophet sees is the the vision of a boiling pot. And I don't imagine this is like a boiling pot on your stove. I imagine a big cauldron seated on a, a coal fire or a wood fire. And I see this big black cauldron that is boiling. And I see that cauldron being tipped and the contents being poured out. And in light of the first vision... This had to be an absolutely terrifying thing for Jeremiah to see. Because the vision that he is given is a clear declaration of God's intention for the nation since they had abandoned God's plan and gone their own way. And it is a guarantee of wrath against the sins of his people. If you want to know more, just go back and read First and Second Chronicles. That's all you need to know. Go back and read about some of the patterns of the people and the patterns of the kings as they sought to pursue gods other than the Lord, as they sought to pursue those gods that are known as demon gods, as they went after Baal and Asherah and all those other Old Testament demons. Just consider how far they went away from God as they pursued idolatry. The people were evil. The kings were more often than evil than not. They had rejected the God's standard of perfectness and God's standard of holiness for the pursuit of idols. They had taken that beautiful thing that God had given them and they had rejected it completely. And here in this vision, God lays his case out against them. They made offerings to other gods. They worshiped idols. They rejected God's best and settled for the siren song of idolatry. And here's the thing, they're not breaking obscure laws from Leviticus that somebody forgot about. They're not breaking some ceremonial law that, that they had neglected. They're not breaking some, some, some caveat that, that's in the law somewhere. They're not breaking that. It's not that they forgot to call the priest because there was mildew in the house. They're not breaking those laws. They're breaking clearly stated laws in the Ten Commandments, idolatry and creating graven images. They're they're violating the, the foundation of God's law. And as a result, the nation would come come under God's wrath at the hands of a foreign power. History tells us that that power would be named Babylon. And as God promised to keep his word in Jeremiah's first vision, the warning of coming judgment is as certain as anything. Ah, that'd be pretty terrifying if, if a prophet of God came and described to you the wrath of God that was coming and told you what was about to unfold. You had seen your neighboring nation crumble under the Assyrian thumb. You know what has happened in the past. You have seen God's wrath poured out against sin. You have seen those things. You've experienced those things. And for a prophet to announce, hey, it's coming for you. 
That would be absolutely terrifying. But we even find those people taunting Jeremiah later on in chapter 17. In Jeremiah 17, 15, listen to these fist-shaking words the Israelites, the, the, the Jews offer. Behold, they say to me, where is the word of the Lord? Let it come. I feel scared saying that, even though it's a quote from the Word. In spite of the clear instructions of the law and the bold warnings of Jeremiah, the people arrogantly say, where is the Word? Let it come. What did God just say about the word? I am watching over it. I am mindful of it. I am bringing it to completion. My words do not return in vain. My word accomplishes its purposes. My word is true. My word is steadfast. My word is strong. Yet the Jews, Jeremiah's day, where is this word? Let it come. We hear these words, and as God's people today, we are rightfully appalled. Or for those among us who have not been bought with the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, in spite of the gospel that has been shared, they live under the same wrath, and when they reject the gospel, they make the same fist shaking declaration to God. There are people alive today who've heard the gospel over and over and over, and they've rejected the gospel over and over and over, and with every rejection, they utter the words, where is the word of the Lord? Let it come. In what is the most famous sermon ever preached in America, the 18th century theologian Jonathan Edwards declared, O sinner, Consider the fearful danger you are in. It is a great furnace of wrath, a wide and bottomless pit full of the fire of wrath that you are held over in the hand of that God whose wrath is provoked and incensed as much against you as against many of the damned in hell. Jonathan Edwards, sinners in the hands of an angry God. But there's an alternative It doesn't actually have to be that way. Why? Because the vision of the almond branch continues to bear witness because God keeps his word. God watches over his word. Salvation is available. You don't have to stand under God's wrath against sinners because God's wrath against sinners has already been poured out on the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says that he made him who knew no sin to become sin for us that we might know the righteousness of God. Jesus took on our sin on the cross. He took our place, for, paid our debt for us. that we might be saved, that we might be rescued from that wrath. It doesn't have to be that way. If you are not a follower of Jesus today, if you've never given your life to Christ today, please hear me. It is not too late for you today as long as you are under the sound of this, of this voice. It is not too late for you today to turn and follow the Lord Jesus Christ and let that wrath that you were due be paid on the cross of Jesus. God keeps his word. And at the same time, God's commitment to his word reminds us of something else. James said the power of life and death is in the tongue. But Jesus shows us that the tongue Our words also give us a pretty clear insight into the condition of our hearts. In his critique of the Pharisees in Matthew chapter 12, verse 35, Jesus says this. He says, the good person out of his good treasure brings forth good, and the evil person 
out of his evil treasure brings forth evil. I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. If you want to know what's in a man's heart, listen to him speak. If you want to know what's in his heart, listen to him speak. But then consider Jesus' words of caution. On the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. <laughs> what would it look like if we really believed that? Because that's one of those passages we really wish wasn't there. What, it, what would it look like if we really truly believed Jesus here? That we would have to give account for every careless word we speak. I think of all the careless words that I've spoken in my life. Words that have been hurtful, words that have missed the mark. If I believe this, then I would certainly watch my words more carefully. I would watch how I speak to other people. And I'm even mindful of the fact that these careless words don't even have to be heard by their intended audience. So when that person pulls out in front of you in the car and you look at them and you, uh, you, know, you declare them with a title, uh, ID10T is my typical title for the person who pulls out in front of me in the car. If you don't know what that means, just write it down, ID10T. And I think, man, they didn't even hear me say that. But it's a careless word that I've spoken. It's meant towards harm towards another person. What if we watched our words more carefully? We should also be alarmed if our words do not match what we claim to be the condition of our hearts. If you're a Christian and you walk around with a filthy mouth, spewing out a critical spirit, tearing down other people, spreading gossip and dissension, you should be concerned about your spiritual condition because those are things that are not indicative of a heart that's been redeemed. I'm not saying you're not a believer, but I will say that those are symptoms of a nasty illness for which you need to be treated. In the same way that wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes are a sign of days yet to come, our words are signs of a heart that is either, either near the Lord or far from the Lord. For out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. If we believe that our words mattered as much as the Bible says our words matter, then we might be far more inclined to use them for building up, for blessing, for encouraging, than for anything else. Would you pray with me, please? Father, I thank you for Jeremiah's visions that speak with clarity about how important you, you hold your word how faithful you are to your word, how you watch over your word to see that it accomplishes its purpose. At the same time, Lord, we see that such a faithful promise is an encouragement. We know that the promises that you make to us are good, that they are true, and even if those promises have not yet been fulfilled, there is coming a day that all of your promises will be fulfilled. In fact, the scripture says that all of your promises are yes in Christ Jesus. And there is coming a day, we know, Lord, that Jesus is going to return, as that is a promise that we hold fast to that has not yet happened. But Lord, as we look around, we see you keeping your word even to that extent as we heed the words of Jesus about wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes in various places. We hear Jesus' words about deception and lies and people being led astray. You are keeping your word. Your word is true and steadfast. At the same time, Lord, we understand that you kept your word of judgment against the nation of Israel and Judah as they rejected your covenant, rejected your promises, rejected worshiping you for other things. But even as they experienced your wrath, you provided a pathway that people could be rescued and saved. You provided a pathway, even for us today. Lord, we deserve nothing but your wrath we are sinners by word and sinners by action and sinners by choice and sinners by motives. We're sinners by birth. We deserve nothing less than your wrath. But God, you, 
you poured out your wrath on the cross. Because you love us so much that you let Jesus down on the cross in our place for our sins. And you extend this gift of forgiveness, this gift of salvation to those who would receive it. And there are people, even in this room, who have heard the good news of Jesus. And in their heart of hearts, they still cry out like Jeremiah's people, where is the word of the Lord? Let it come. Oh God, it doesn't have to be that way. Salvation is available to those who would receive it. Jesus did what I couldn't do. Died the death that I was due. And by his blood, he received sinners like me. So God, if there's any here today who have rejected that offering over and over and over again, Lord, impress upon them that today is not too late. They can be spared the wrath to come by acknowledging the wrath that's already been poured out. Likewise, Father, let us guard our words as they reflect the condition of our hearts. Let us be mindful of how we speak and how we use those words. May we be more like you in that as we watch over our own words. We pray these things today in Jesus' name.